you bring a Bible to the house of God today? Turn to Matthew chapter 12, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 12. There are and have been across the world secret societies. Some have which have referred to themselves as the brotherhood. Well, I don't want to alarm you. We're not part of a secret society here. Amen. There is not a here's and here's why. There is nothing we believe that is kept secret from anybody else in the world. Nothing. In fact, I happen to know that in some secret societies, they maintain their secrecy by use of maybe a password, some form of secret handshake or some sort of secret sign that the members would flash that others might not know. We don't have any secret passwords here. We don't whisper things into people's ear here because number one, they'd probably slap you if you did. We don't, we don't whisper things. This is done in some secret societies. We don't whisper a word to you or a phrase and then tell you, now if you repeat that phrase outside of this room, outside of this brotherhood here, we will slit your throat from ear to ear and they make this sign. We will slice you open, pull your bowels out, burn them with fire and then scatter the ashes to the four winds of the earth. We don't do that to people. In fact, Jesus told his disciples, and I think it was specifically in regards to secret brotherhood, secret societies, and so on. Jesus said, what I speak into your ear, you proclaim from the housetops. There is the idea that uh, various of the disciples were in on a secret doctrine that Jesus and this particular disciple kept from the rest of the disciples. In the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, which Mary Magdalene did not write a gospel. But in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene that they found, it's a Gnostic gospel, there's the idea that Jesus had a, like an affair, a relationship with Mary Magdalene, and he told her the secret doctrines that he wouldn't tell the other disciples. And Peter actually got jealous because in one place, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene says, and he used to kiss her on the mouth openly. In front of the other disciples. That's disgusting. Um, the gospel, I've told you about the gospel of Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot supposedly was in on a secret deal with Jesus. Where Jesus had a secret doctrine that he had received from John the Baptist. And that Jesus shared that only with Judas. The other disciples didn't know. And he asked Judas, Judas, we need to play good cop, bad cop. I'm going to be the good cop, you be the bad guy. Judas, I need you to take a hit for the team. I want you to pretend that you're against me so that I can be martyred so that people will follow me. That's actually in this. They found one copy buried out in the desert somewhere of the gospel of Judas Iscariot. It's tattered and torn. Parts of it are missing. But that was the gist of it, that Judas Iscariot was actually a good guy. I'm sorry, but the gospel tells us that Jesus called him the son of perdition. That's the name for the Antichrist. So there's nothing secret about our brotherhood. In fact, it is to be done and displayed openly. Jesus said, they shall know you by your love for your brethren and the disciples. What is this brotherhood? Matthew chapter 12. Turn your Bible there. Start in verse... Number 46. And we find Jesus and he's doing his miracles and he's giving his teaching and the scribes and the Pharisees, of course, they hate him and Jesus is rebuking them. And then in verse 46, the Bible says, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother, which was Mary and his brethren stood without desiring to speak with him. Did you know that Jesus never referred to Mary as Mother, 
He never called her that. In fact, when Jesus addressed Mary, what did he call her? Woman. Hey, woman. Ooh, that'd get him slapped today for sure. Amen. But the idea in the Catholic Church that Jesus honors his mother's request to him, is that even close to being true? Absolutely not. In fact, Jesus nails it right here. His mother and, by the way, Catholic doctrine also teaches us that Mary maintained her virginity after she gave birth to Christ. But is that true? No. Jesus had half-brothers. In fact, one of them was James the writer of the, the book of James. So verse 47, Then one said unto him, Behold thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? Now I want you to pay attention to this. I know we call Jesus our Savior, our Lord, our King, our God. But have you ever considered Jesus as our brother? He is. I never had a brother. God cursed me with a sister. But anyway, just kidding. I love you, Marie. We play like Donnie and Marie up here. I never had a brother. Always wanted one. Mom and dad never had, never had a brother. So, verse 48, he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Verse 49, and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother, what was he talking about? And my brethren. Verse 50, this is what I have underlined on the screen. For whosoever shall do the will, in fact, read this out loud with me. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Do you believe God's word this morning? Say amen. amen. Father, I pray your blessings upon your word. I thank you, dear God, for allowing us to come together into your house. I pray, dear God, that you bless each and every one of these families. Bless each and every one of our family and friends that are online. Not just those that are here, but those scattered around the world. Father, you have called us into a new family. A family that according to your word is far greater important than any earthly tie that we have here on this earth. Whether it's a political tie a fam familial tie, some organization that we belong to, nothing in our own race, nothing in this world is of more importance to us than our heavenly family. Nothing is. Help us to see each other that way. Help us, dear God, to love one another that way and to care about one another and to see the people that we sit across the pews from and the people that we greet at the church door. Help us, dear God, to see them as our brothers, our sisters. Help me to teach this this morning. Let it be a blessing to all of those who hear. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Turn to Luke chapter 8. We have a... A backup verse to that, but Luke says it, as you will find, a little bit differently. Luke chapter 8, verse 19. Open your Bibles there. I want you to follow along with me in, the, in your Bible so that when you read this again, you'll remember it. You'll remember it. Maybe God will add to you a blessing that you didn't get from here. God is, do you believe God can do that? You believe that as you read the Bible at home, God can add a blessing to you as you're reading the Bible someplace else that you didn't get in church. Somebody say amen. So you know what I'm saying to you, right? Go home, read your Bible. Amen. Luke 8, chapter, 9, or chapter 8, verse 19. The Bible says, Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him. In other words, the crowd that was there, there so many people there, they couldn't fit in. 
And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. And he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. And I want you to understand this. To the Jews, the only people that mattered were the Jews, according to them. They had it in their mind that no matter what their sins and transgressions were, that they were still and would always be the only people of God, that God had chosen them, and that gave them a sense of arrogant pride that they were never supposed to have. And like I said, it didn't matter how deep into sin the Israelites got, they still welled up with pride over the fact that they were the chosen people of God. And I want to tell you something. If we're not careful, that's exactly how we'll get. You know, they press the president how many hundreds of times where he had to come out and say, him and his press agent had to come out and say, the, the president absolutely stands against any form of racism or racial superiority or right supremacy. How many times did they ask him that question? Did, would he make an emphatic statement? And he did dozens and dozens of times. And they still want everybody to think he's a racist. We, as God's people, and our relationship one to another, Jesus is telling us, that that family relationship is more important than anybody else. Did you know that with the exception of James, Jesus' own brothers didn't believe a word he said. They rejected him. In fact, they mocked him. And here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus knew that he came from God the Father... And he meant what he said, that those who believe the word of God and do the word of God, that they are his brethren. They are his family. And Jesus is getting across this notion. Nobody, nobody in this world that you might be related to either by family, blood, kinsmanship, race, you might belong to an organization of men or women, or you might belong to a particular society, or you might say, well, I'm an American. Nobody is worth you missing out on eternal life for. And even though we have the record of Scripture that for the most part, Jesus' own brothers refused to believe in him, that wasn't going to hold Jesus back from doing what he knew God had called him to do. Hebrews mentioning that Jesus said before he left heaven, Lo, I've come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, O God, to do thy will. And Jesus said, My brethren, my mother, the fact that he was from the tribe of Judah mattered little to him because if his own people weren't going to believe him, then he was going to go and find people that would believe him. And we know that's true. We know that Jesus left his own people and instead of them believing the gospel, he went out to the Gentiles and preached it to them and they believed it. And now you, if you believe God's word and obey God's word, then you are a brother to Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Which means you're fixing to be rich. Wealthy. With the wealth of heaven itself. I hear that in heaven... The streets are made of gold. I just might go chip me up a bunch of that. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Actually, you won't need to, amen? What is there to buy with it in heaven? Everything's freely given. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. 
Notice this. In fact, the Bible is going to then secure this doctrine in us so that we understand it. Jesus is our brother. In fact, he was the firstborn brother. Notice this, Romans 8, 28. And by the way, under, underline this part. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Do you believe that? Say amen. Why did, why did we have such a rotten, stinky year last year as a church? Why did we have so many people rebel and leave? I don't know. But I know the things that God has called us to do this year have been probably some of the greatest things that this church, I've been part of this church since I was eight years old, and I can tell you this church has never done what God has let us do this year. I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, I'm just telling you. What was going on was God was birthing things. Any good thing that God does in your life, he births it. And you know what happened? You ladies know about birthing, don't you? After the first one, you swore you'd never do it again, right? Never do this again. Get away from me. But the blessing of those children, amen? There's nothing like it in the world. God gives us the gift of birthing wonderful things into this world. And what God was doing was the labor pains, the birth pains, the sorrows. That's what COVID was about. Was it a hit by the devil? I, I absolutely believe that. I think the devil hated us. He hated the fact that we'd come in here, love on one another, fellowship with one another, care about one another, Pray for one another. Carry one another's burdens. And the devil said, I'm going to scatter them to the four corners. And for about three weeks, we didn't even have church here. I was laid out. And God took one of us to be with him. I still, I hate that. I hate it for Sister Jan. And what a loss to our church. We lost one of our best patriots. And one of our finest men. And I don't want to lose anybody else. But I think God has a reason even for COVID in our congregation. All things. He did not say all things are good. But he said all things work together for good. So when bad things strike, bad times hit. I know some people in this church that are about to go through hard times and they don't even know it yet. I'm not some prophet. I just happen to know some things. But I'm here to tell you that all things do work together for good. Because who's our brother? Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. I want you to notice this. God saw you before the foundation of the world. Before he created the world, God knew you. Robert, God knew you. God knew you before you ever confessed to sin to him. God knew you would do that. Because that's what he said. For whom he did predestinate... He foreknew. He foreknew you. He also did prede predestinate you, meaning God knew the outcome. God knows the outcome of your life. Trish, Melissa, D, John, Melissa, Dave, Anna, Gary. God knows it. Joe, Emily, Rose, me. Did I miss anybody? JR, Callie. All y'all. God knows the outcome of your life. He knows what decisions you have made, are making now, and will make. And God says, well, how about that? That just happens to fit in with my exact will for his life. Imagine that. Do you think that's by accident? No way. God saw it. So then he predestinated you to be conformed 
to the image of his son. What is it that we know about brothers who come from the same daddy? They look alike. Amen? They look alike. You get to know me and Melissa pretty well and get to look at us. You can say, yep, there's Don Hoggart in her. There's Judy Hoggart in him. You'll see it. We see it. Sometimes we don't like it, but we see it. Amen? But he conformed us to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at there. Jesus was the first one and every one of us have followed him. This is why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be what? Born again. Not of the same mother and father. They're cursed. And that birth was cursed. That birth was doomed and destined for hell. So God birthed us again. And now we are in a different image. We look just like God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Look just like him and act like him and talk like him. Amen. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. Notice all these terms are in the past tense. Does God know? Everybody look up here for a second. Does God know the sins that you're going to commit. Jerry does. He's already got them written down. He's just waiting for you to show up to them. And you will. Trust me, you will. But he called us. He's already predestinated us. He's already justified us. And then he said, Then he also, and whom he justified, Then he also glorified. Remember what Jesus prayed in John 17? He said, Father, these my disciples, glorify them with the glory that you and I had before the world was. That means that we are going to shine like Jesus. Why? Because we're born of the same Father. And this is a copy of our DNA. Who in here believes the NIV is the Word of God? No. What about the Christian Standard Version? What about the Message? What about the Living Bible? What about the King James? I got tested. I'm KJV positive. This is how we test who is and who isn't. That, that amazed me. Dave went to Kenya and I was preaching way out in a village east of Nairobi. About two hours east of Nairobi. We drive there every day. And... I had an interpreter. The people read and spoke English, but they said I had an accent. I don't have an accent, do I? No. no. Kenyan people have an accent, but Americans don't. They said I had one. So they would have someone translate in Swahili. And I asked the translator, because I was going to teach something about DNA, and I asked the translator, I said, I don't want to just assume everybody's dumb, but would these people know about DNA? And he said, DNA? And I said, yeah, DNA. He said... Yeah, that's how we find out who's the father of such and such kid. I'm going, sounds like America. So I told him about DNA. This is God's DNA right here. His word. This is the proof that he is our father and that we have been tested positive that we are the brethren together of Jesus Christ. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. And by the way, this sermon this morning is just the setup for the rest of it. As I put this together yesterday, I went, there is no way in the world that I can get through this in one sermon. Can't do it. 
Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. Notice this. He says it again. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. And who's the one we are of? God the Father, who is our Father. In every sense of the word, he is our Father. Because he hath begotten us. The Bible says he has begotten us unto a lively hope. He uses the same word of us that he used of Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave, who? His only begotten son. So what is he saying about us? That he has also begotten us as the brotherhood along with Jesus, the firstborn. And as such, the Bible then says that we as the brethren are joint heirs with Jesus, the firstborn. You see, in the, in the law, it was the firstborn who got the father's inheritance. It was the firstborn. So whoever was lucky, I guess, or chosen to be born first, they got the blessing. You remember what Jacob did with Esau, his brother? Esau had the inheritance, did he not? But he sold it. Sold his birthright. He sold his everlasting inheritance for something temporary. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people in this world who've come in church, been offered the blessing of eternal life to receive the inheritance of Jesus Christ. And yet, what did they eventually do? They went back to the world and traded in an everlasting, wealthy inheritance for a temporary pleasure from this world. Be not as Esau. Amen? So, where did I, where did I miss? Okay, Hebrews 2.11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause, listen to this, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Gary, I ain't picked on you yet. Gary, answer before this congregation this morning. Have you ever done anything sinful or wrong? Get out. No. God dealt with me years ago. Struggling. And I said, God, surely, surely, you did not call me. And God said, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. If God sanctified you, and He truly sanctified you, He's not ever sorry that He did. Because remember what God knows. The outcome of all of your decisions. He knows your choices. He knows your heart. The Bible says that God knew Pharaoh. And God chose Pharaoh to be buried in the bottom of the Red Sea for a reason. God knew that Pharaoh would always harden his heart against Israel and against God. He, uh, he knew it before he ever started sending Moses saying, let my people go. God knew what the outcome would be. God knew that his whole purpose in using Israel as bait was to draw Pharaoh to be buried in the bottom of the Red Sea. And God showed forth his glory using Pharaoh. So God doesn't just pick the good guys. He knows all the bad guys too. And I guarantee you, he uses them for his glory and his purpose. And to show forth his goodness in our life. Amen. And he is not ashamed to call you his brother. Now, our mother had a brother. And this brother, that's for me, tell him I'll call him back when I'm done. This brother... I mean, some, some kids are just born 
to be obnoxious. Our grandmother ran a little, the, their version of a little convenience shop back years ago. Her, her husband, our grandpa had died and when all the kids were little and she was just forced to run this little convenience shop. Well, our uncle, Sonny, when he was about five years old, climbed up the shelves thinking he was getting a box of chocolate. But it wasn't chocolate. It was X-Lax. Ate the whole box. Had to go to the hospital. Talk about meanness at a young age. Well, from a young age, he learned how to smoke. Anything he could get his hands on. And from a young age, he learned how to drink. Anything he could get his hands on. And from a young age, he took every woman that came along in his path. Fathered children everywhere. We found out we had a cousin lived in, didn't think she used to live in this area? Died in his 30s from cirrhosis of the liver. A long, horrible death. Never made it to 40 years old. Now that brother is kind of like the black sheep of the family, we call it, right? Somebody can say, who is that guy? Well, that's my brother. Oh, I'm sorry. But not Jesus. Not Jesus. He gladly puts his arm around you and he says to the world, this is my brother and I love him and I'm proud of him. Somebody say amen. He is not ashamed to call them brethren saying, look at this. I read this verse one time and I went, whoa, Jesus sings. You ever thought about that? Who would be the best singer in all of heaven? Jesus! Wouldn't it be great to go to heaven just to hear him sing? Look at this. Verse 12 saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Jesus is not ashamed to come here in our midst and sing with us when we sing to Jesus. Somebody say amen. He's not ashamed to come in our church. Amen. And guess what? He does know us. He knows all the slop we came out of, all the filthy, nasty sins we did, and probably will do some of them again. He knows us, and yet he's not ashamed to come in our midst. And again, he said, verse 13, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. Verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus came down to be us. So look at this. That through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death, who was afraid to die. I was, still am. Now, I'm not afraid of going to heaven. I'm afraid it'll hurt before I get there. That's what I don't want, Dave. I don't want the pain that goes with it. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 16, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels. Jesus was not a semi-god or an angel. He was the angel, chief of all angels, but he was also the son of God and son of man simultaneously. He took not in him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, and by the way, who in this world loves the Jews? Nobody. Nobody. They hate the Jews. 
Jesus chose them and their seed to be raised up, knowing the world would hate them. Because Jesus said, it's not you they hate. It's me. So verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his who? Brethren. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Why did he descend down from his lofty heavenly position where there's no harm, no sorrow, no death, no pain, no suffering? Why did he choose to leave that to come down here to be born in our bodies so that he would know what it's like to suffer hunger, thirst, mourning, loss of family, loss of friends, the suffering of pain, extended pain, long-term pain. How long was he on the cross? Six hours? Nine hours? Suffering all day long. And then to know what it's like to pass from this life, death, to the next. And you know why he did? So that he could come to us and say, I'll lead you safely across that bar. Fear not. Say, I asked God, the day I got electrocuted, when I knew my life was over, I knew that I was going to die. And I surrendered to it. But I had some doubt. And I had some fear. And I've asked God multiple times since that day, God, when you take me for real, I don't want to be afraid. And you know what I believe? The day that I die, I won't be. I won't be. Like I saw with Lee Walsh, Sister Betty Walsh's husband. The night he died, they called me to the hospital. And Betty met me out in the hallway and she said, Mike, Lee's not, he's talking out of his mind. I don't know what you're going to get when you walk in. I said, Betty... God will take care of it. I walked in that room, and Lee looked at me, and he said, Hi, Mike. Pastor, come over here. And he said, Hold my hand. And he said, Let's pray. And that man prayed, God, have mercy on me. God, forgive me. God, bless me. He got done praying. I don't remember what all he said, but he said this. He said, I just wanted to know for sure. And he died that night. And I've seen it with others. A man that used to come here, his name was Bob. He didn't know he had heart problems, or maybe he did. He just didn't tell anybody. And he went up for a, one of those tests. You walk on that deal, and they measure your heart. And he didn't do very well. And they said, we need him here the next morning because we need to do a little catheter up there, and we need to see what's going on with his heart. And I remember being in that room, in his pre-op room with his family, and they're all cutting up, trying to ease the tension, telling jokes and everything like that, and Bob broke in that, and he said, I just wanted everybody to know, if anything happens to me today, I want you to know where I am. I'm going to home to be with Jesus. And I tried to cut that tension by saying, don't worry about it, God's got it all under control. And that man, they put him under, and he went to see Jesus that hour. He had perfect peace. I've seen it multiple times before. And I know how God will take us from this world to that one. He will give us perfect peace. No matter how our death comes, 
He is our brother. He has done this. He's our big brother. Amen? He's our older brother. He's our, the guy that we run to when we're in trouble and say, brother, go get him. And you never know. Jesus might say, but I'm going to save them. Leave them alone. I ain't going to kill them yet. I want to save them. And we're supposed to say, okay. Hey, we need more brethren. Amen? But I'm telling you, he will go with us because he has walked this route before. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. Somebody say amen. Let's bow our heads. That's just, that's just part A, part one, part A. You may not have ever thought about it before. But Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. He is our king. He is our Lord. He is our savior. He's our God. He, he's the boss. He tells us what to do. There's nobody higher than he is. And he is our firstborn brother. Making us the brethren. Same family. All of us have the same brother. Let's treat each other likewise. Father, I sinned greatly this week. Because I went against a brother. And I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done it. There was no excuse for it. And I've apologized and made it right. But I should have never done that. Because Jesus has never done that to me except he's correcting me out of love as my brother I am so unclean and so undone my mouth is full of guile and deceit father would you purge my lips sanctify my mouth that I can speak truth in love to my brethren. Jesus, thank you for going ahead of us, preparing the way, and you're the only one who knows the way we don't. So Jesus, we trust that when it's our time, you will walk with us and not leave us, nor will you forsake us, and lead us into paths of righteousness. Thank you for being our God, our King, our Lord, our Savior, our High Priest, our Mediator. Thank you for being all of those things, but thank you for being our brother and being willing to not be ashamed of us. Help us then to not be ashamed of you either. No matter where we go, no matter what earthly part we might play in this world, no matter what organization we might belong to, no matter what country, no matter what race, no matter what society we might be hooked in with, God Help us to never be ashamed of our righteous brother, Jesus Christ. No matter where we go, and help us to understand, God, that there is nobody on this earth that we might be associated with that is worth losing eternal life for. I will not follow anybody 
into the gates of hell. I won't. If I lose all of my friends, then I've lost many. If I lose all of my family members, I will not follow them into the gates of perdition. I will follow my brother Jesus into the house of the Lord to be with him forever. Help us, dear God, to not be ashamed of Jesus and help us, dear God, to not be ashamed of one another. This is our family. Thank you, God, for giving us this family. We needed it. We didn't have anybody else. And you brought us here into this place. Thank you, God, for doing that. Bless us, Lord. Help us, dear God, to never be ashamed. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet?